Hey, what's up? Jason here, and today I want to tell you a story. It's a story about my buddy Jared, MMORPG development, and a 10,000 line function, as you probably saw in the description of the title. Now, I got to know Jared while I was working on Vanguard as a big AAA MMORPG. I had a blast working on it, and we both started around the same time. We were both pretty new, but he was definitely a much better programmer than I was. I could tell right off the bat that he understood new things way, way more than I did. In fact, he um, was the guy who came in and, as a junior guy, found and fixed a giant performance issue that increased the frame rate by probably 10 times. He was, was a huge huge impact on the team. So this story, though, takes place after we'd worked together. We'd already split up. I'd gone on to EQ2, and he was working on EQ1. And we didn't talk nearly as much, but one day I'm talking to Jared in the hall, and he mentions he was working on a new change to the inventory system. So he's got a change. I don't remember exactly what it was. Something with how the items were equipped. It may have been bag size changes or something else. So Jared's there digging through this giant code base, relatively new to that team, and finally finds the method where equipping is dealt with. And the method is, yes, 10,000 lines long. In fact, I think it was a little bit longer than that, maybe even close to 11,000. This is a single method, not a class, not just a bunch of methods calling methods. It's a giant method that's indented in multiple times with lots of braces and brackets and everything. It was the exact kind of thing that you really want to avoid and really get terrified when you see. It's the kind of method that you open up and you go, I have no idea how this works. I'm not really sure what's going to happen if I change this, and I'm pretty sure I'm going to break things. And I don't know the exact details here, but I think that's kind of what happened for a little while is that they probably had a lot of issues with inventory and things just breaking, making minor changes was very, very hard. And the reason for this is that they'd built up a ton of what we call technical debt. Now, before we dive into how to fix and address this technical debt, I want to go over the definition from Wikipedia real quick, which says that technical debt is a concept in software development that reflects the implied cost of additional rework caused by choosing an easy or limited solution now instead of using a better approach that would take longer. Technical debt can be compared to monetary debt because if that debt is not repaid, it can accumulate interest. And that interest is in making it harder to implement changes later on, which is exactly what we see with Jared in this 10,000 line method problem. And in fact, any change to that inventory system was probably extremely expensive and very slow to implement because when you have a 10,000 line method or any other strong technical debt, it gets hard to make changes. It's very risky and you just have to test and test and test. But before I badmouth technical debt too much, I wanna talk about where this debt comes from. And it's actually just from our code or our infrastructure choices. It's the stuff that we put together. And that is kind of building up our debt. I mean, we can build up a lot more of it with a couple, I'd say, small mistakes or just bad assumptions. And the first and most obvious one is just a complete lack of any architectural planning. So if we go into our project with no real idea of how we want to put this thing together. We just know we want to make a game and we're going to throw stuff together and find as many different things as we can and slap them together. We're going to end up with probably a ton of technical debt because our systems are not going to be really designed to work together or they most likely won't. And they may just be kind of slapped together and pasted onto each other. A small change to one or maybe an update to one will break a lot of other ones. And this is, I'd say, the most common cause, but it's not the biggest one because usually those things get addressed either relatively quick or the project doesn't ever get off the ground. What usually happens for these bigger projects, how we get all of this debt, is that we'll come in with a plan, at least from the beginning. We'll start off with a plan, a very solid idea of how things should be built and what we're going to do. And we'll start off with that really well and you know, keep everything in line, everything is good. But as time goes by and as emergencies pop up and new requirements appear and new people cycle in and out of the team, the code starts to slowly grow and get messier and messier. And people find a little hack here and there. They start copying that hack over to another spot. And then that hack gets copied to another spot. And it gets copied to another spot. And eventually, a lot of little mistakes start to add up. And they become a big, big problem. Another cause for technical debt is just making the wrong decisions or making decisions that are right at the time, but then 
the rules change. And an example of this I can think of is when I was at Qualcomm working on some internal projects and working on one that had been around for, I think, over a decade. And then one day we get a note from the legal department saying, hey, this UI framework that this entire tool is built upon no longer meets our legal requirements. We need to replace the whole thing and it needs to just be swapped out. Now, of course, this project had not been built for swapping out the UI because almost nobody ever builds their project with the idea of swapping out the UI because it's usually way too much overkill. It's the kind of thing that you don't need to address until some emergency weird thing like this pops up. In fact, I'd say make sure that you don't. Don't try to make your thing so generic that you can just swap out the UI just in case something weird like this happens. But know that this kind of thing can happen. And this technical debt was pretty big. I mean, I think, I don't know the exact numbers, but we had multiple developers working for multiple months in a rush, kind of pausing and delaying other things just to get this done, just to address this one legal change that had happened. Remember, no technical things had changed at all. There was no business benefit here other than protecting the legal side, which I mean, obviously protecting the legal side is important, but we weren't getting any extra technical benefit out of doing all of this code stuff. It was all just extra work that had to be done and it's all more technical debt. Now, before I go into how the whole thing turned out with Jared, I wanna talk about a couple ways that you can avoid technical debt. The first is not gonna be liked by a lot of people. A lot of people are gonna go, oh no, I don't wanna do that. I'm just gonna skip ahead. So if you don't like this one, don't worry. There are other options, but I would always recommend unit tests. Testable code tends to be cleaner. It tends to be better in general. Not always, but it tends to be. And more importantly, I'd say most importantly, it lets you refactor your code and clean things up without worrying about breaking stuff, or at least it drastically reduces that worry. And that leads us on to number two, which is probably the most important. And that's to refactor your work as you're going along. So when you go through your code and you see an issue, you see a method that's too big, you see a thing that's doing too much or a big giant switch statement that's getting copied and pasted, clean it up. Just think about it. Think about, hey, does this need to be like this? Can I clean this up now? before it turns into a nightmare. You don't wanna end up waiting until this method is a thousand lines and the switch statements in 30 places to try to clean it up. It's gonna be dramatically harder. You wanna refactor it and clean it as soon as you can, as long as you're not breaking things. And again, that brings us right back up to the tests because testable code makes it easy to refactor without really risking breaking things and without wasting a lot of time. If you refactor a lot without unit tests, you never really know exactly what happened and if things work. Well, you could, but it's a whole lot harder at least. And again, I really wanna reiterate that it's really important to not copy bad things. So if you see bad patterns in the code base or if you've done something bad, try not to just copy and paste that again and again and again, because as you do it, other people in your project will see it or future you will see it and they'll keep doing it, they'll keep copying it. And pretty soon the bad stuff, the things that you know are bad that you think like, hey, I should have cleaned that up. Those become the normal thing. That becomes what everybody's doing because they've seen you do it. They've seen you copy and paste it. They've seen you add it in. Other people are just going to you know, rightfully assume, hey, this is the way that we do things. Don't make it the way that you do things. Clean it up as soon as you can. Again, with tests, don't, don't break things when you're cleaning it up. Nothing's worse than going in and refactoring and cleaning up code, but breaking everything. Nobody's going to appreciate that. Nobody's going to like it. You're not going to like it. And it's going to exhaust and kill you. So make sure that your code is at least very tested, ideally unit tested, and then refactor it or refactor in small enough chunks that you know for sure that your stuff is safe and solid. Now, when you're building this stuff out and planning it, there are some other things you wanna do. Make sure that you think ahead about how a system can be used and don't just code it down to the bare minimum spec. You need to really think through how things are gonna be used in the future. If this one new system, like this one new item system, or this thing is, say, you've, let's, let's go with um, a very basic example. Maybe you've got um, a game where you need to be able to increase the strength of your player so that their damage goes up. You have a million different ways you can do this. Um, perhaps the first request just comes in as, hey, we need to be able to make it so when our player grabs this apple, they're stronger and they hit for 10, 10 more damage. 
What you don't want to do is just go in and immediately go, okay, let's go in there. We'll make an apple. When you pick up the apple, it adds 10 damage to you. Like that could be the case. Maybe that's the right solution, but you don't want to dive in and just code that up right away. You need to think this through and think, hey, are there going to be other situations that add damage, that add strength to my character, that make him hit for more. Is it going to be just this apple? Or tomorrow is the designer going to come back and say, oh, also when they pick up this sword, I want that to happen. Or when they hold down this B button, I want that to happen. Or as they level up, I want that to happen. And suddenly you might realize that, okay, this code that I was thinking is just for this apple to just increase damage isn't for the apple at all. In fact, it's really just maybe triggering something on the player to cause this stat to go up and this damage to go up. And I need to build a system that's extensible and usable enough to handle all of that. But again, not too complicated. Perhaps I'd just go with like a simple stat system on the player and a couple different ways or one way that a couple different things can interact with that stat system to increase the stat. Perhaps like a give stat mono behavior or an I give stat interface that they're implementing where they're adding some amount of stats to the player. Um, and not, I guess, again, the key thing is we don't want to end up with a big giant mess of code where we have like, hey, if I have the apple, my health is plus 10 and, and my damage is plus 10. And if I have the sword, my damage is plus 10 more. And if I have, you know, level seven, my damage is plus seven more. We don't want to end up with a big giant mess of code like that where it's a switch statement or a bunch of if statements adding things up because then we have to go back in there and we have to modify it every single time. If we split things out and architect it right from the beginning, knowing what we want to build, then we can just start adding these things in very easily. Perhaps we just add in like a new piece of food that implements an interface or a model behavior, not have to touch our player at all. And that's kind of what we want to go for. We want to minimize the amount of code that you have to change when you want to make a change to your game or add something to your game. Now, with all that said, if you do talk to your designers and they say, hey, nope, this is just an Apple game. You only pick up apples. There's never going to be anything else. Don't build the crazy thing. Don't over-architect. Don't build things that you're not going to need in the future. All that does is waste your time now and waste your time in the future. It wastes other people's time on your team as well as they're looking through, trying to figure out, hey, what is this thing? Why is it here? How does it work? And then they find out, oh, yeah, it's a thing that we built, but we never actually needed and used. So it's just extra confusion. Don't overbuild. Build exactly what you need and maybe what you're going to need, but nothing beyond that. Don't think about like, hey, what if maybe one day they want to adjust this one thing this one way? If they do, then you should have your system set up so that it's easy enough for you to add that little change without pre-adding it just in case. So you might be wondering how Jared's situation turned out. Well, he did end up fixing the entire mess, but it took, I think it was around six months. So this is six months of one of the best programmers on the team coding away, trying to clean this up and refactor this. And six months of no changes, no updates to that section of code, and just slowed stuff down. But I think the bigger cost, again, was probably throughout all of the years, all of the changes that probably got bounced back and forth, the bugs that appeared, and just the time that it took to implement each one of these little changes as that file or that method grew to 10,000 lines. Just imagine being the one that's adding lines 10,000, 10,001, 10,002, and just thinking, I have no idea if this is going to work. I hope this doesn't break things. So it ended up good, but again, big giant cost and a big giant mess and something that you really want to avoid. So uh, before we wrap this up, I wanted to just give a couple tips on ways that you can minimize technical debt or how to know how to address it. Because a lot of the time people see stuff and they go, hey, I know this is bad, but I'm not really sure what I should do. How should I fix this? There are a couple things that I like to recommend that I do personally. Um, the first and the easiest is to just look at other people's code. Go through and look at what other people are developing. Um, I like to do this through YouTube videos and just actual projects, just looking at real projects on YouTube. Or sometimes people even send them in to me and let me take a look at them and show them online, which I love doing. It's awesome. Uh, but there's all kinds of code out there. You can download source code for all kinds of projects freely. Just go in there, see what you can find, and look at a couple things. Don't just look at one person's code. Everybody's going to code different. And you're going to see a lot of different styles and a lot of just variety and quality and just 
tips and techniques, I guess, that you can pick up to minimize and clean this stuff up. But also show your code to other developers. I know a lot of the time people are afraid to show their code because sometimes they're like, hey, I don't know if this is good enough. I don't want people to you know, say anything bad about my code. I don't want people to laugh at me. I don't want people to realize I don't know this one thing. Um, nobody knows all the stuff. Nobody's really, I mean, somebody might give you shit for it, but they're you just ignore them. Um, but most programmers are generally pretty chill, pretty nice people. So just send it over to somebody you know, some other friends of yours, some other coders you work with, and just ask them for feedback. Now, it, ideally, if you have very specific questions, you're like, hey, this portion of code, I'm not sure what I should do with this, or like, I'm trying to figure out this specific thing. You know, point those specific questions out. Don't just throw a whole code base at them and assume that they're going to know what you're thinking about. They may just find little things. So throw at them the the portion that you're really curious about and that you really want feedback, and you'll probably get much more specific answers and more of what you want. But also join local meetups. So if you're not in any of the local Unity meetups, I would definitely recommend that you join some. I go to all of the ones around here as often as I can. There are a bunch on meetup.com and on the Unity site. So if you're not sure if there's one around you, just go look. The developers there are, again, mostly just like you. A lot of them are very shy, very chill, laid back, generally pretty nice and relatively helpful. And they just kind of want to hang out with and talk to other people that like to do Unity code and game stuff. And the final option, of course, is just to hop onto Discord servers and talk to people. I have one set up for the patrons, by the way. Thanks, everybody on there. You guys are really awesome. But there are a bunch of other... Um, open ones and community ones, Discord servers, um, even Slack servers. I think Discord's kind of where it's been for Unity stuff, though. So just go look around. You can find some Discord servers. I think I even have some up on my blog listed. Um, anyway, I hope this is somewhat helpful. And if you like these kind of videos, these little stories where I'm just explaining things and blabbing on without showing too much code, just let me know. Drop a comment below and... Um, a like and all that stuff, share it. And also, if you have some cool, interesting stories about technical debt and you don't mind sharing them, I'd love to hear them. Um, drop them down in the comments below. Shoot them to me in an email. I just love listening to and absorbing these different stories and sharing them as I can. Anyway, thanks again and goodbye.